Um, can you hear me all? Yeah, all good. We'll um, move on to the third slide, which talks about the uh, Swan Water um, Global Hub. Um, hopefully what you're seeing is a slide which um, demonstrates the many innovative organizations that are part of the Swan ecosystem. Um, uh, you can see there's some really, really um, innovative water utilities as well as some fairly innovative and out there um, technology companies as well uh, playing in this space. Um, when you go to the next slide, Inzol, and you look at the Swan APAC members, um, you, you can see who are currently members. And one of the things I would like to ask is we're trying, you know, we want to grow the Swan APAC membership. But there's a uh, um, there's a um, reference down the bottom of that slide. Um, uh, anyone um, that's on this call um, that would like to be a member of uh, SWAN and leverage the benefits that SWAN deliver, um, please make contact. We'd, we'd love to have you part of the SWAN APAC uh, membership. Um, the next slide quickly, I just want to promote the July 7. Uh, webinar that the Swan APAC Alliance is running. Um, we've got three great speakers. It's a free webinar. Um, it'll run for about an hour. Um, so um, if you are available, um, please join us for that webinar. Um, move on to the next slide, which is all about demystifying, demystifying smart water. Look, I think it means different things for different people. And um, when I reflect on what this means for me, it, it's not about the technology, um, I'm sorry to say, but for me, what it's about, it's customer environment, our business partners and the people that work in the business. And I believe that, you know, smart water, uh, it's about, uh, it's enabled through digitization. And from my perspective, it's not a C. It's not a CIO or a CTO-led uh, conversation. It's, in my view, it needs to be a CEO-led uh, conversation where they set the vision and the direction when it comes to digitalization. Now, for me, and the reason I say that is, you know, the CEO needs to be responsible to ensure that transformation in the business takes place as a result of making changes through digital. So that transformation uh, in the way you run your business is really important. So I said, um, it's not a, for me, it's not necessarily about the technology and the software, although that is very important, but you need to understand why do you want to get involved in smart water? Why do you want to get involved in digitization and transformation of the business? So, you know, what's the compelling why? Is it because everyone else is doing it and you want to do it? Or do you have a really, strong purpose behind why you want to engage in this space. It's gotta be more than just because everyone else is doing it. So for us at Unity Water, the compelling why is linked back to our purpose. And our purpose is keeping communities healthy um, by providing an essential service. And one of the ways we wanna do that is to provide better customer experiences. We wanna provide a better environmental outcome we want to provide um, better financial outcomes. We you know, want to strengthen the balance sheet. And we also want to provide a very good employee experience. So there's some of the reasons that we're embarking on digitization, which is underpinned by our purpose, which is about keeping communities healthy. So I think you need to spend a fair bit of time understanding and in the planning space about what's the problem you want to fix. Um, and why is it a problem? And what are the options to addressing that problem? So I'll go back to, you know, how can we use technology, analytics, software, AI, ML, it's already been touched on today, to fix what is a problem. And when you start to think about the problems you have in an organization, and, um, and it could be the way you uh, interact with customers, the way you manage your assets, you need to lend your mind to what data do we need to collect? Now, my experience has been everyone wants to collect everything and you use hardly anything. So what's the data you want to collect in order to be able to make better decisions 
and present that information and present that data in a manner that uh, provides that allows people to pro um, create better information, uh, better insights that allows them to make better decisions. So let's look at a couple of examples. So um, at Unity Water, we want to improve the customer experience. And, and the problem, let's say, what was the problem we want to solve? So we wanted customers to be able to solve their own problems when they want, in the manner in which they want, so they don't have to call a call centre. Because our call centre is open, you know, let's say nine to five, like most call centres, uh, unlike the contact, unlike the emergency control room, which is 24 seven. But if you just wanted to transact on something that's to, that's to do with your bill um, or a general interaction with the organization, that's not of, you know, an emergency, we want the customer to be able to self-serve and do that when they want in the manner in which they choose. So what we embarked upon was to, um, create an outcome whereby today 88% of the transactions that take place in our contact center, our customers can self-serve on by accessing their account and transacting um, and not having to touch base with the contact center operators. What that does, um, it does a number of things for us. Customer can self-serve when they want. It means that we can uh, reduce our costs in the contact center. It means we can um, allow those people to focus on the more complicated uh, customer inquiries that can't be self-served. And it provides a better overall experience um, for our uh, customers because one, if they've got a complicated problem, they can get through to an operator very quickly. And if it's not a complicated problem, they can get on, the, on their laptop and they can resolve it within, click, uh, within three clicks is our goal. The other thing we also do um, as part of our analytics and and digitization is we also want to make sure that our customer can actually fully transact um, so they don't drop out of the process. So we want to make sure that apart from providing the channels, it's easy for them to work through the process and it's not a time consuming exercise for them to do so. And that's an important part of not only making a channel available, but also making it really, really easy for them to be able to, to use. Look, an another example very quickly, we've just rolled out um, we're close to rolling out 10,000 smart meters. And for us, it's about, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Well, one of the problems we want to solve is customers don't have bill shock because when they get their bill in 90 days time, if they've had an internal leak or they've had high consumption um, and were not aware of it, um, it can add up to a significant amount of money. Um, so we're doing things like if you use if you use $5 or more in water than your normal consumption, proactively notify a customer because they may have an internal leak. And, and what we're trying to work out is do customers want to be proactively notified of an issue or do they want to self-serve on issues? And, you know, if I take myself as a typical customer, you know, even though I've had an electric uh, meter, um, electricity meter for a long time, I actually don't go and self-serve. I, my preference is for someone to tell me if there's a problem. And, you know, we're starting to think about customers might, might value um, the opportunity to be able to be informed of an issue as opposed to making the capability available to them and, and asking them to self-serve. Um, one of the other th uh, reasons we're embarking on digitization and the problem we're trying to solve is to reduce non-revenue water or leakage in the network. So our digital program from, you know, um, is about being able to undertake real-time water balancing uh, exercises where you know exactly what comes in and what, exa and what it exactly gets sold on a real-time basis. So if you do have leakage within the network, you're able to um, uh, address it uh, in real time. Look, from an asset management perspective, and I'm back on what's the problem you want to solve. Um, if you look at an asset, asset management, um, if what you're trying to do is to extend asset life by improving asset performance, and therefore reducing the capital program, and therefore depreciation, that's an important, you know, it's, it's a mix of issues there. But if you, can, if you can, at the end of the day, 
reduce your capital program by 10%, extend your asset life by 10%, think about the positive impact you have on your financials and the benefit for customers because their bills don't increase as much. Maybe you can flatline them if you're able to actually look at extending the asset life and reducing your capital program. So for us, you know, that's again, we're making that a problem where the solution we want to solve is not increasing a customer's bill on the back of a capital program, if that makes sense. And I think it's already been touched, um, but one of the byproducts of digitizing your network in particular, and I think Ben, you may have touched on it, you end up with a digital twin. So you, you, we, we actually don't set out to establish a digital twin, but by default, the fact that you are digitizing your network, one of the side benefits are is that you end up with a digital twin. And as you know, we can play in the digital world to see what might happen in the real world uh, uh, and play and undertake certain scenarios. So look, in closing, um, when it comes to demystifying smart water, uh, for me, it's about knowing what's broken in your business, knowing what you want to fix, and the commitment to see it through by adopting technology, adopting software, changing business processes. Don't underestimate how important that is because you're still going to need people to support um, you know, um, um, the, the, the digital outcome. So it's going to significantly affect the way business processes operate um, in order to create you know, some really meaningful insights that deliver real benefits to customers. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not just the customers, but also to our environment, strengthening a balance sheet. And, and don't underestimate, you also want to be able to deliver a better workplace experience for the people within the organization who are adopting these new tools in order to be able to make better decisions on behalf of on behalf of the customer. So look, I'll leave it at that. Okay. So I wanted to start uh, by just having a, a conversation, I guess, around what value means to the water industry. Uh, Martin, I think you've lost sound there. Thank you, Rob. My apologies. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to the session and uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, I wanted to start this presentation uh, talking about what value means uh, to uh, a water utility and, and really what role data plays in that. So when we think about high level trends that the water industry has faced over its lifetime, you can see that there's a real clear evolution of what creating business value means. And uh, I've, I've really leveraged um, the, the Queensland industry uh, with these photographs, but you can, you can see, you know, around the late uh, 1800s, um, the water si uh, supply system was established and then moving through uh, into the, the 1900s, the focus was absolutely on uh, delivering public health outcomes. Um, moving on then through into uh, the new millennium, there was a, a real drive towards improving the environment. Um, and, and today we have a, a focus on, on water security. Um, these are, are just some trends amongst others, but it shows, I guess, the, the level of change that as an industry we have already been through. So with that in mind, it's really easy sometimes to forget that most of our systems have been designed assuming that there's no data available. We've got uh, assets in, in the ground from a hundred years old to one day old. Uh, and traditionally the cost of collecting small amounts of information from the network exceeded the cost or the value that could be gained from that data. And I think that that has really led us as a, an industry um, to be incentivized 
to really build capital solutions to solve a lot of the problems that we've experienced in the network. Uh, and when you think about it, approximately, you know, 8% of our assets in, in Brisbane anyway, were installed and buried in the ground um, while horse and carriage were on the streets. I think we've still got wooden pipes in the ground. We were 50% were before GPS became commercially available and around 90% before we even had 3G communications. Um, and we are still progressively uh, starting to roll out and expand uh, IoT uh, levels of communication as well. So um, the, the assets that we've had in the ground um, were definitely designed prior to our current uh, era of, of being data centric. So what that means is that this technology disruption um, that's enabling access to low cost data now uh, is giving us a unequivocal opportunity to disrupt the way we do our business and to create value. The challenge that I find um, and in my experience has been defining what then is value for an organization or for a utility. And we have a continuing um, sector or spectrum really of what is value. So um, what might have been value in, in the 1980s or, or the early millennial of preventing dry weather overflows, uh, that has now evolved and we want to prevent wet weather overflows. Um, from, water quality, from a water quality perspective, uh, there was a, a point in time where we uh, wanted to have zero boil water notifications. Now the drive is on to have zero E. coli. Um, there's a, a trend that has moved us from meeting compliance into discretionary performance. So how do we successfully disrupt with data? Um, and how do we know that we're actually creating business value or creating community value? And for me, I think there's, there's five clear stages of thinking before we even put technology in the ground or before we even start to think about um, data uh, systems. Um, and it's really the higher order thinking around how are we going to um, develop our game creators um, or in, in, enact our pain relievers around our strategy. Um, so becoming really crisp and really clear on what business value is to your utility, your community, your organization, your board, your executive, the people that you work for is the very first step. Um, ensuring that you can draw a line of sight to that value creation through to corporate strategy and recognize that the benefits need to be an, uh, enabled and measured over the long run as opposed to the short run. And these things need to consider uh, what kind of competencies you want to create or keep within your organization. So uh, do you want to insource aspects of, of your organization or do you want to outsource with, re rel uh, with relativity to the technologies that you choose? Do you just want data as a, as a service or do you want to own the technology that's actually in the ground? These are key questions that need to be asked uh, before we move further forward in developing a strategy. Um, the next step is really looking at uh, our operations and our people and really recognizing that not all value creation requires technology or data, um, but generally all value creation requires an operational change. And also um, that we really need to think about, can the organization actually do something with the data? Um, can we modify our processes to actually do the work differently, do the work more efficiently or make decisions in a different manner? And if we haven't trained our, our people to be able to do that, then we're really fighting uh, a losing battle. And I think some of the times the reason we fail with uh, introducing new technology or, or, or trying to leverage data is that we haven't considered the organizational element of it. Um, the, the next step, once we've worked out uh, around what is value and uh, what 
uh, operations, uh, cha operational changes uh, we need to make in the business, um, then we, we can start looking at the technology. And probably uh, the key thing I think we need to be mindful of here is we need to be ambidextrous, focusing on our core systems that exist today, like SCADA and, and other methods of collecting data and human methods of collecting data. But we also need to be really future focused and uh, be able to operate at two speeds while we deploy and pilot different sorts of, of technology uh, and data uh, acquisition strategies that we then pilot within the business. And the last uh, is the, the architecture around, um, uh, do we wanna uh, have a unified model? Do we wanna be diversified? Um, do we want to integrate uh, with corporate? Do we want to keep the DMZ between OT and, and ICT? And a lot of aspects in the architecture are really dependent on the technology roadmap that's developed um, as to that, that then in tune decides on or helps you frame up what architecture you want. And then uh, the, the fundamental a pillar underneath it all is, is data governance and setting rules around how we will actually manage this data um, and what are the, the processes uh, for ensuring that we're actually getting the benefit um, and maintaining the, um, the accuracy of the data as we go through the, the, the pilot or the, um, the transformation. Now, I call out this uh, slide here, thank you, as a, um, uh, an example of, of some ways that uh, strategic uh, questions that businesses can ask themselves to help define value creation. Because in my experience, this has been the area uh, where we've struggled the most um, in uh, a variety of, of uh, sec uh, sectors that I've had, had exposure to. So um, starting with uh, what is our winning aspiration? Um, generally, what are our strategic goals? Um, where are we going to play? Are we going to look at, you know, take a catchment view or, or take a DMA view or, or take a, a geographic or regional view? How are we going to win? Are we going to have specific uh, performance targets or specific um, uh, criteria related to the demographics of that, that catchment? What capabilities do we need in place? Uh, back to the operational readiness component. And then what systems are required? And it could be operational technology. It, it could be uh, a variety of other systems, but, but they're really good framing questions to uh, help us. And then from the, uh, those framing questions, what we can actually do is then start to build a, a capability roadmap to take us from where we are uh, at the moment to where we want to be uh, in order to create business value. And, and that may involve things like um, different trials that we need to uh, undertake um, that we want to fail fast on and, and decide whether they are um, beneficial to create business value. Uh, whether we uh, need to roll out enabling technology and what sort of things we are going to implement. But most importantly, it's what capability or value are we acquiring into the business. And because we're sort of, I think, in the first five minutes of this uh, technology disruptive or this era of technology disruption, uh, I think it gives us a really good opportunity to think differently about um, some of the ways that we've been undertaking uh, business. Um, so to the point that uh, because of the lack of, of data, you know, we've, we've grown incentivized to build capital to solve the industry's problems. Um, what that's sort of, I think, led to is a certain uh, uh, thinking around the way we manage business cases um, and, and potentially some, some pilots as well. So I'd like to pose that um, the, the business cases that we define uh, over uh, rolling out new technology actually consider long run benefits and consider themselves in an ecosystem. It's very hard to define benefits from 
uh, a platform or from an IoT network, but combined with the device uh, that's acquiring the data, combined with the organizational capability to be able to act on that data, then you can actually get a response uh, that creates value for your consumer or your customer and your community and for your business. So I think that there's benefits come in more classifications than financials and benefits relating to a roadmap or capability development over the long run is really important. Um, the other thing that I think about pilots is um, it's very easy to test a, a pilot technology. Um, what's harder to pilot is a business's capability to be able to use that technology and use the data that is acquired and created from it. And I think a good pilot tests that. A good pilot actually tests that we've got our, our people in place, they know what to do, um, they've got their standard operating uh, uh, models or, and procedures around when to dispatch field crew and, and when to act on, on different uh, alarms that they receive. So I think uh, testing an organization's capability gives us the ability to sustain um, and be really confident that uh, the pilot is going to be a successful one. And that really, I think, uh, will give us what we need uh, to be able to build upon ourselves to prepare for the future um, and ensure that we continue to evolve like our forefathers and, and mothers did in the uh, uh, early um, sectors of the water or early eras of the water industry um, to be able to uh, solve their problems that they had. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Martin. That was a really interesting presentation. I'll have a few good questions for you at the end. Um, I'll hand over now to Ben, who's going to, from Red Eye. Thanks, Ben. Awesome. Cheers, Martin. That was really interesting. And thanks, Rob, as well. So, evening, everyone. As mentioned, Ben Young from Red Eye Apps. We're a Brisbane-based software provider. And tonight, I'm just going to build on uh, the description Martin just went through and give a case study from the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And then that case study is going to try and just present some examples of value that's being driven from foundational data improvement. I'm then going to discuss how we can then take that foundational data and look to utilize that in uh, particular models to improve asset management. And what I'm going to really hone in on, on that particular example is digital twin solutions. So just wait for the clicker. There we go. So yeah, the case study I'm talking about tonight is Southern Nevada Water Authority. They're a large water utility in the US serves about 2.1 million residents. And the key challenge that Southern Nevada had was they really had large volumes of asset data coming into the organization, wide varieties of formats and locations, but some inefficient document management practices was really inhibiting the use of that asset data in a productive way. Um, there was real difficulties in taking the data to collaborate with organizations, you know, whether that's um, internally or external parties. And really, I guess the value that was being, um, you know, potentially available from this data set was really inhibited. Um, there was excessive search times to find accurate information. And really, the organization was trying to rely on an intrinsic asset knowledge base rather than taking that step forward to a, a digital type uh, environment. So what do we do to try and address this document management process? Essentially, we provided uh, SMWA with a cloud-based engineering drawing and document management system. Um, prior to its implementation, some of the issues that were being uh, addressed or identified were you know, less than 10% of users could actually find the latest drawing or document. 33% of users were taking over 10 minutes to find the drawing. And 55% of users couldn't trust that the available version was correct. And that type of... Um, I guess mistrust of information really was inhibiting value being driven from the data sets that were available. So after implementing the DMS platform and um, some measured improvements in value, this is you know the financial information, um, but I'll get to some other points after this. So yeah, 450 hours saved per month, um, drawing search times reduced to two minutes, and duplications reduced to or oh, by 24%. And that duplications is really a, um, a sign of siloed information across the organization. There was lots and lots of data that was coming in, but because information was not being collaboratively shared across, there were silos and pockets of uh, duplicated information occurring. 
And when that occurs, you know, it's really hard for the organization to trust the information they've got and get value out of it. Um, so by removing that duplications of information, creating a collaborative environment where the data can be accessed, you can really start to drive value. And in this particular case, it was a return on investment of less than 12 months. Outside of that pure financial information though, this was really moving away from relying on intrinsic asset knowledge and moving to a readily available um, data set the entire organization could access and there was no um, sort of inhibitors to new stuff coming on and accessing that information, really ensuring there was a collaborative environment where both internal and external parties could access the information they needed to. Sorry, just waiting for the clicker to work. Yeah, so essentially that case study was really talking about foundational data improvement and giving SMWA a data set that they could now begin to build on and really try and address some key industry challenges. So, you know, Martin really went through quite a few of these key industry challenges, so I won't go over it again, but just some of the, I guess, key ones that can be um, you know, picked off from better data management is really trying to improve supply to customers. Water utilities, we're working with an aging uh, infrastructure base. Assets are being looked to uh, be utilized past their nominal life. There's also new assets continually coming in. So having better data management, utilities can really look to improve that quality of supply from a supply point of view, as well as quality, and enhance that value to the end customer. You can also reduce operational expenses, ensuring utilities maintain value for money for customers and we can provide better plan maintenance across the network as well. You know, perhaps most importantly to a lot of organizations, safer operations as well. Having poor asset data really can be quite a health and safety uh, aspect. If we've got field teams going out into the field and they're working on pump stations or switchboards and they can't access accurate information, there's clearly health and safety benefits or issues that can arise from that type of situation. So once we've got a foundational data set in place, like SMWA, now look to try and move to um, perhaps more uh, innovative or detailed solutions or opportunities to drive value from data. And one of those is digital twin. Now, I know digital twin is quite a, a broad term, can mean a lot of different things to uh, a lot of different people. But specifically today, I'll just quickly talk about a, uh, a particular type of digital twin. So. The one I'm gonna describe is a, a data rich 3D model of a physical asset, where we're really representing the physical asset uh, alongside data aspects. And those data aspects can be lots of different sources. We've got live data coming from sensors and SCADA. We've got the static 3D models. We've got supplier information. And really what uh, uh, you know, our visualization of a digital twin is bringing all of that information together into a visual platform so that users can really start to make the most of that information. And that example there is a, of an RO train, but really a, a digital twin can be representative of any asset. It can be network wide, or it can be extremely focused in on particular assets. Um, so yeah, the value that can be driven from digital twins. So I sort of touched on it before, Real-time monitoring and feedback provided to operational teams has real value benefits in the way that we operate assets. We can really start to drive process improvements, uh, reduce those operational costs, reduce uh, major incidences that can impact customers. Alongside that, outside of uh, an operational or maintenance aspect, having more data allows better simulations of future situations so that capital delivery teams can really start to drive uh, improved capital spend where it's needed. Predictive maintenance is an obvious one, but I guess really with digital twins, what we can do is we can start to visualize what's happening from a maintenance perspective, move away from uh, lines on a spreadsheet or that type of thing, and provide maintenance teams with a way where they can really start to understand what's happening on the assets. Um, that last point, bi-directional information sharing is quite an interesting one, but inherently as utilities start to build up large uh, databases, we can start to look at the external customers as well and start to think we've got large types of uh, organizations or critical customers who could really start to utilize the same information that's coming from the network 
how can there be better information sharing between these types of customers? As with anything, there, there's risks. Um, and I'll just close by highlighting some of the, the sort of, I guess, fundamental risks that can uh, or should be considered with a digital twin. And right at the top of the list is data accuracy. As we're looking to merge legacy data sets, uh, the accuracy of that information becomes critical if decisions are going to be made from that information. Design and data formatting consistency is important so we can maintain the accuracy of the digital twin once it's established and ensuring there's clear ownership and integrity of that data set. And coming back to Martin's point, right at the, across the bottom of it, we always have to make sure there's affordability and value being driven from any uh, digital solution. And that's it from me. Um, thanks everyone. I'll now hand over to Patrick uh, to continue the conversation. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. That was a great, uh, great conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, so, um, you know, in, in just coming off of a, a conversation about digital twins, you know, it, it is all about data, you know, the way I think about, you know, kind of how a digital twin flows with, you know, you really have to focus on getting data ingested from various sources and then, and then adding context to that, to that data. So really, really interesting uh, data strategies around digital twins that I think that'll be uh, increasingly important as, as, as we move on. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, I did want to spend a little bit of time here, uh, not, a, not a ton, but just kind of going over some of my thoughts on, on what I, we're seeing in the market around uh, kind of accessibility to data and what I think are some really interesting aspects of access to data right now in the water market. So uh, I think people have seen this type of uh, slide before. Um, if we look at connected device growth, uh, around the world, we're looking at between uh, 2019 and 2024 a growth of about 10 billion devices uh, being connected to a total uh, in, in say 2024 of about over 50 billion devices that are connected. And obviously that just creates a tremendous amount of data and you have to figure out what to, what to do with that and how to be smart about that. An interesting note is that IoT data IoT connected devices are increasing three times faster than non-IoT devices. However, in the water market, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that's gonna hold true over the next five years, and that'll, be, uh, that'll remain to be seen. So when I think about data and what I call the cloud-driven water, util water utility, you know, and, and Martine talked about this, a lot of what was built, you know, early on wasn't assuming that data would be available. So you've got data in all different silos. So let's get data into one place. And obviously, you know, I believe the cloud is the, you know, the best place to do that. Um, because then once you get your data in one place, it's so much easier to secure and govern your data, which is so critical today we, we, in, this, in this era of cybersecurity. So another, another key point. And then once you have that, then you can actually start making some sense of that data. And the tools that are out there today, if you haven't explored them, um, business intelligence tools that they have advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning built right into them. And what used to take us even just a, two years ago, three years ago, you know, kind of days to, to get a dashboard up and running can be done in just absolute minutes. So. Um, so, and obviously less time, you know, looking for the data means more time, more time innovating. And it's important to us, you know, important to me because two out of the top three uh, uh, workloads that water utilities want to move to the cloud uh, with some research that we've done is uh, data mining and just data, data management. So, so this, this aspect of data, data management is very important and, uh, and that sort of thing. So the, I'm sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a problem here with my, with my slide. Okay, um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is uh, some interesting changes that we're seeing, at least speculating, thought this would be a creative conversation um, around communication of data. Because you talked, you know, and Ben talked about his digital twin, you know, getting data into the cloud, data, getting data ingested is just incredibly, uh, can be challenging. So. We're seeing a lot of advancements in low power technology. So smart meters and utility applications that are connected by low power uh, technology will 
you know, is increasing uh, incredibly. So 300 million by 2023. And so these kind of, that kind of brings up kind of, kind of hybrid modes of network as a service or you know, utility owned or municipality owned uh, type of communication um, uh, opportunities. And we're seeing a lot of advancements in, in LoRa applications. And, uh, and I think that some of that stuff's gonna even get, get more creative. One of the things that we've done at Amazon and, and folks may or may not know about this is called Sidewalk. And it's a neighborhood network that's created by your Amazon Alexa and your, your, your Echo device and your Ring doorbells. And it, it's, we've just gone live with this in the United States. And I think this type of technology is gonna provide a lot more access to interesting data because this is a free, think of this as a free pipe uh, in, the fr in the front yard of all of your customers. It's, it's this, this rise of the neighborhood network is going to, is really going to offer, maybe it's not going to change so many things, but it's really going to augment some opportunities that people have for access to data. And then we're starting to start to see, you know, type of satellite technology out there with SpaceX and Coopier and, and, and other things. Uh, so this kind of communication changes uh, are coming and they're continuing to evolve very, very rapidly. And then the, the other area that we see that's, that's changing or is interesting in the terms of the types of data and, the, and, and how uh, easy you can get this data is in the area of anomaly detection, particularly relevant in the water space. So one of the, the tools that we've recently launched here at AWS that's very relevant for the water market is called Monitron. It's, uh, it is very low cost anomaly detection. We are talking you know, under a uh, hundred, under a thousand dollars for um, uh, for five sensors in a gateway, and it is it gives you your installed base of analog kind of pumps, motors, any kind of rotating equipment. It gives you within an hour you can be up and running on real artificial intelligence and machine learning based uh, anomaly detection, and and I highlight that because I think it's so easy to now get this type of data uh, so quickly and it's such good data that uh, I think that's a real change that's coming in the market. And then the other one that I'm really intrigued about I, and I think it's coming out there is particularly we all know that water and electricity don't mix very well. So, you know, this idea of creating battery free sensors is really important, is kind of very intriguing to the water market. And there is technology out there that is, that is being explored, it's being used today, um, where we're harvesting uh, Bluetooth and other types of radio waves that are out there into uh, very, very small sticker-like sensors that can be used for temperature or movement or moisture or vibration or or other things. So this kind of battery free technology is coming and it's, it's just gonna create an opportunity to get data it's so much easier. Imagine if you're a water utility and you could send your customers in the mail in, in, a, in a very thin envelope, you know, five or six stickers that they could place in their home that would be instant, that would be pre-programmed to, to drive some very interesting data to the cloud, maybe moisture data from underneath your sink or maybe a sticker on the side of your, 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 your toilet or your cistern um, that gives you some additional information. So this type of data is really changing, is gonna really change the game over the next couple of years. That's at least, uh, that's at least my belief. And then the final one that I don't, uh, that I never wanna, you know, kind of gloss over because I think it's, it's an area that's really ripe for some additional innovation and that's human as a sensor. We talk about all these 50 billion devices that are gonna be connected you know, by 2024 and, and all of that sort of thing. But a lot of times we overlook the idea that a human with a cell phone might be one of the best sensors that's available to a water utility. And um, you know, humans need water and our brains, that part of our brain, the laminia terminus, which tells us we need water, um, are incredibly tuned into this. So humans pick up on things related to water much better than than than, uh, than a mechanical sensor in some ways. So that smartphone uh, and other technology 
uh, creates an opportunity for you to empower your customers or, or just humans out there to be providing additional data. And I think this kind of human as a sensor technology can be connected to call centers. And we're starting to see some of that. We've got a partner of intelligence uh, that's, that, that's created some AI-based uh, phone applications for video recording that are going right into, uh, say, uh, Northumbrian water in the UK is, uh, using this kind of technology now. So, so those are kind of three areas that I think that are going to change the game on, on data quite a bit over the coming years. So uh, neighborhood networks, uh, some really low cost anomaly detection and, uh, and human as a sensor. So Rob, trying to keep us on track here. <laughs> Done well. <laughs> Thanks for that, Patrick. Yeah, three great uh, presentations and um, we've only got uh, about five or six minutes left. Um, so jump in and take on that last point, maybe back to Martine. Um, human as a sensor, I know is a lot of utilities are trying to use sensors to avoid interaction with um, humans or you know take it away from our customers so they don't get annoyed by us. Um, what do you think the balance is between human interaction and sensors? Yeah, I think, I think uh, the, the balance between um, uh, our customers and uh, we, we want to be able to be as um, uh, effortless for customers as we possibly can. Um, so there will be things where we potentially could leverage customer views, um, but you wouldn't want to be doing, you, we want to move away from that where it uh, becomes a problem. So where there's uh, water bursts or, or sewer bursts mm. or, or those sorts of things. Um, it's a really interesting concept, uh, the human as a sensor, and, and I'm keen to actually hear a little bit more from Patrick about um, do you actually mean by that just uh, visually seeing a, a, a burst um, or do you actually, is there, is there something more to it? No, it's, it's, it's you know, the, the type of technology that I was just mentioning where, you know, uh, a, a customer, if they see a water leak or whatever that, that they can video record that and that's updated, that's uploaded right into the CMMS system. And so it's, you know, part of that kind of work workflow for maintenance. Um, but interestingly enough, in that case with Northumbrian water, I'd have to exactly check it. But I think Martine, about 63% of the customers agreed to opt in on this program so it was a it was it, that was a surprising you know I, I know what you're saying we want to make this effortless but then I think people are so comfortable with that phone in their pocket that you you get a higher hit rate on that yeah and I think I think uh it's still effortless if we can uh innovate and, and modify the way that they do connect so if there's uh if we look at you know the uh industries where like a uh pizza, Domino's pizza or Uber Eats, you're, you're kept it informed the whole time. So it feels effortless because you're, you're actually aware that your message has been heard and you know what uh, stage of the, um, of the process your the job is in. Um, so I, I definitely think there's, there's potential in that space. Yeah, yeah. Great conversation. It just shows how things go through cycles, I guess, isn't it? Um, Ben, I was wondering, you talk about the importance of clean data for um, digital twins. What do you think the balance is between getting the data right first versus making some movement then iterating through? Is there a good practice way, you think? Yeah, look, it's, a, it's absolutely a great question. And I think there is absolutely a balance because, you know, you can get stuck in analysis by paralysis if you're always mm -hmm. waiting for the absolute perfect data set before you move forward with anything. And I think there's... You know, a lot of value can be driven from very simple um, solutions as well. You don't need to have the full uh, entire network mapped out with every sensor uh, across every location before you can get value from these types of solutions. Yeah, a lot of value can be driven from just a simple 3D model and giving teams visibility of what's happening across uh, a construction project or a, a pump station, whether it's, it doesn't even include live data or anything like that as well. So yeah, I think a lot of value can be driven um, by simply starting the process, starting uh, on a digital journey of some format and continually improving uh, along the way. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. That's, that helps out a lot. Um, Patrick, um, 
a lot of great things. One one thing that intrigued me, I guess, was um, you said, will the water industry catch up or will they slow down? Do you think there's something in particular that gives you that vibe that might be flatlining? For for uh, for data, um, you know, I think that uh, for the water industry, I think that it is the the ability to access data so effortlessly and be able to have that, um, you know, get machine learning, the benefits of machine learning very, very quickly without a lot of, uh, you, you know, fuss, fuss to it. Um, I think, you know, for the, for the last, you know, 10 years, you go in and you talk with somebody about a, a, a complicated digital twin or artificial intelligence, machine learning, you get a little bit of a gloss over at times. But if you can show them so something like a monotron or other solutions that are mm. out there that are, you know, within an hour, you know, here's the here's the sensor, you attach it to your pump, and here's what it will tell you on your smartphone. I think I think that gets us over the I, that's part of what gets us over the line, Rob. Ah, good. And yeah, a lot of great exciting stuff. I'm really looking forward to those battery-free sensors. How, how long do you think till some of these great technologies? Are we talking months or years or? In the, in the future, well, you know, battery-free technology, battery-free sensor technology is here. Um, when it comes to the water industry, I think uh, is I'd like to think that it would be uh, less than less than a year, but oh, wow. uh, but we'll we'll wait to see. Yep. Yeah, and what's what's stopping it from being mainstream? Is it just the technology or the cost, or do you think it's like solar and takes off eventually? I think there's so there, there are so many changes that that are happening so quickly yeah, that that's it. I think it's just yeah. you know getting the technology and, and prioritizing it for the market. Great stuff. Well, thanks thanks to the three speakers tonight. That was that was really exciting and really interesting. And um, I hope people on the audience um, learn as much as I did. To another topic, which is called uh, global perspectives on smart on the smart water journey. And we actually have a truly global panel here, uh, carbon efficient, but global. Uh, we have Andy from the UK, we have Rebecca from New Zealand, uh, we have Nick from Australia, and a moderator from Switzerland. So there you go. So I'm Helge, uh, I'm a civil and environmental engineer by training, but have been working at Emerald Technology Ventures, a globally active uh, venture capital firm for the last 15 years been responsible for the water sector there. Uh, we've been one of the very first SWAN members, I, I think somewhere among the first 10, 10 years ago. And if I see the slide that you just shared, George, uh, it's impressive to what it has grown and there are good reasons for it, as we all know. So that's nice. Uh, just to add a little bit more color, we have been working with companies like Pure Technologies, Takadu, Optimatics, Hydropoint data system. So digital has always been a big topic for us and we continue to be highly interested in it and also support SWAN. Uh, next to that role that I have with an Emerald, we also manage a water tech incubator, Ripple to Wave uh, in Singapore. And we just actually concluded a three month digital water hackathon program there. Uh, the demo day was a couple, couple of days ago. Anyhow, enough about me. Uh, let's now start with a round of introductions with, uh, with the panelists. After that, we will have a 20-minute uh, Q&A session among us. We will then use 10 minutes to open it to the floor. Um, please, uh, an, an invitation to the audience, if you have any questions, just type them in. And Rob uh, volunteered to help me to addressing these questions. Uh, so that we can also have a little bit of interaction despite being virtual. So that's it for me as introductory remarks. Uh, and how about we travel with the sun and start with Rebecca introducing herself. And then we dive into, um, well, first of all, continued introductions with An Andy and Nick, and then dive into the questions. Over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Helga, and um, I would say good morning, but in, in New Zealand here, it's good evening. So uh, good evening to you all, and I will apologize in advance for my niggly cough. Um, I can confidently say it's not COVID, but it is annoying. Um, I am Rebecca Chingery. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at WaterCare here in Auckland. Uh, WaterCare is Auckland's water and wastewater provider. 
um, to the 1.7 million people of Auckland. Um, and in my role as Chief Technology Officer, I have responsibility for all of the IT and OT systems, effectively all of the technology that supports the running of our water and wastewater business here. Thank you. So, Travelling with the Sun, Nick, you're next. That will be me, thank you. Um, uh, hello all to all the uh, attendees. Um, my name is, is Nick, Nick Burrell. Um, I'm the Vice President of Industry Strategy uh, and, and Go-to-Market for Oracle Utilities. So Oracle Utilities, we're a, a, approximately a 1,500 person strong um, industry focus group within the larger Oracle Corporation. And, and we provide end-to-end -end technology solutions for the world's water and energy companies. Um, me, uh, I, I work closely with, with utilities, energy and water, um, to help guide our solution roadmap, obviously, and that's digital solution roadmap now, of course, is what we're talking about today. So I'm really passionate about the, the dramatic transformations that are occurring in our industry and, and technology's role in all of that. And for many years, I've, I've consulted in the business and information technology domain, but providing strategic guidance and things like that. And overall, I guess, you know, a whole firm to believe that technology, when done right, it is a positive agent of change and not just for the utility, of course, but for the local community it serves. So, um, yeah, so thank you for um, inviting me to this panel. Thank you, Nick. And last but not least, Andy, over to you. You're on mute. Or you look like you're on mute. I am on mute. That's my first failure of the day, because <laughs> it was an early morning here. Um, so I'm Andy Smith. I'm the Smart Water Strategy Manager for Anglian Water in the UK. Um, so Anglian Water is the largest water and water recycling uh, utility based on geography, serving around 6 million customers. Um, and we do face some unique challenges being on the far east of the UK. So we are the driest region in the UK. Our rainfall each year is equivalent to that in Jerusalem. Um, a quarter of our region is below sea level, therefore climate change is at the forefront of our mind. And we're already seeing the effects of those um, uh, impacts in terms of changing weather patterns. We have the highest growth outside of um, London. Um, with that also comes the challenge around the fact that we have less resources and our resources that are available to us will be reducing over the next 20 years as well. So ultimately, we need to look for different solutions in that space. So my role at Anglian Water really is to drive innovation and the adoption of smart solutions within the water business stream. Um, I manage a team of 50 um, subject matter experts in that space. Uh, we need to take those solutions, move those into business as usual as quickly as possible, delivering better outcomes for our customers, the communities we serve, the environment, but also at the same time, improving system performance and driving efficiency, reducing operational costs at the same time. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's impressive to hear uh, the role that you have and the team that you have uh, working with you on these topics, right? I guess that's not very common across the globe. And it's probably also related to the unique uh, setting in the UK, but, but we get to that. I think you already alluded to something that uh, George mentioned as well, and that is the why, right? I think, I think in the water space, one of the unique elements is that it's very, very complex. Um, very many different dimensions, and within each dimension, very complex. Social science, natural sciences, health, environmental protection, and so on and a lot of value at stake, right? I mean, the money that has to be moved to make things happen is substantial. So I, I do think that's where digital solutions lend themselves to naturally, but they come with their challenges. Maybe to kick things off, Andy, um, staying with you a, a bit here, within, since this is about the journey that we took in the smart water space, within the journey that you took at Anglian around digitally enabled solution, what would you think brought the biggest value proposition uh, to the table uh, in that journey? So I think just to start that one off, we've been digital for a number of years. You know, we've, you know, since privatisation within the UK back in 1989, you know, digital has formed its part. Um, there's a lot of talk about things like digital twin, but, you know, we've had network models, things like that, which I still believe are a version of that. 
Um, but particularly recently, I suppose, in the last two AMP cycles, which are the investment cycles in the UK, it's all been around system optimization for us. So traditionally, we had a lot of technology on our critical infrastructure in terms of um, water treatment sites, water recycling works, but actually our, our, our networks, um, our distribution systems were actually poor in terms of digital coverage. So we've really started to invest heavily in terms of fixed correlating um, sensors to um, find leaks more effectively. We've done a lot of work around pressure optimization. That's around smart pressure control. That significantly contributed towards leakage reduction, but coming back to the previous point about um, extending the asset life cycle, um, reducing burst frequencies, reducing distribution input. We've also now embarked on a, a large program of fixed high resolution pressure loggers. And you can start to see, you know, when you start to join flow and pressure together in real time, you really start to get some insights that you haven't seen. The other area coming back to those um, sort of water treatment works and that critical infrastructure is around condition-based monitoring. And then the other program we've, we've really got running over the next two amps is moving towards smart metering. So we'll be installing this five-year period over a million smart meters, and that will be followed by a million in the next amp. And I think the benefit of this, and we're, we're slowly starting to realize this, is is really then the development of the operational technology platform and how we integrate these data sets because we're starting to get um, where we've taken these data sets which has previously been separate and it's driving enhanced actionable insight for our people um, and that's through visual visualization you know the ability to do that on your phone with systems in the workplace you know and, and i will just cover that point around it's really important that this is about your people as well you know, you, it's, it's no good just embarking on a tech fest. Um, you need to look at your processes, you need to look at your people, and this is all about enabling our people to add value. So it's really across the board, right? It's about operational issues like, like leakages. It's about yeah. your asset management, uh, where you bring in condition assessment to extend the life cycle, but it's also about customer engagement. So actually not one single out area, but quite broad where digital was helpful in your journey. Rebecca, maybe let's let's look at it uh, from the devil's advocate perspective. Uh, what what uh, were the things that you tried out in the digital enabled solutions that you think didn't actually deliver uh, very promising results or weren't adopted or yeah, simply didn't have the value proposition that that was necessary for people to buy in and use it? Thank you. Yeah, I think what we have seen is um, increasingly anything that is a is a point solution that is um, targeted at a specific use case, which is a lot of what our legacy solutions have been, has very limited value. Um, and I think you know, hitting on a point that a number of the previous speakers have raised, the game changer here is in the opportunity to bring the data together um, to correlate. Um, and analyze across multiple data sources and to really increase the level of sophistication that we can apply to that data to inform business decision making and ultimately to become you know, predictive in what we're able to do with it. So without naming specifics, I think you know where, where we haven't seen value is where we have taken an approach of a point solution and you know to echo the point that George made earlier, where we haven't really been clear on what problem we're trying to solve. Um, so I, I strongly agree that you know the, the path to success here is to acknowledge that change comes from the nexus of people, process, technology, and data. Um, technology in and of itself is unlikely to solve any problem in isolation. And in fact, in many cases, it can make the situation exponentially more complex and worse. And um, so I think you know to lose sight of actually what problem are you trying to solve and to acknowledge the part that people process and data play in solving that problem alongside technology sets you up for a, a far more successful outcome. And um, it's fair to say where we haven't had successful outcomes, it's typically because we haven't done those things. Okay, thanks. And now moving over to you, Nick, uh, if I understand it correctly, your main region that you cover is JPEG, um, but probably you have a very strong perspective on, on the global scale as well. 
within the water space, we, Andy mentioned a variety of different uh, digitally enabled approaches. Is there, do you see any differences across the region? What is more, what is more asked for currently? Uh, what is in demand, so to speak? Uh, is it somewhere more the leakage side? Is it more general decision support on, on uh, CapEx programs? Whatever it may be, are there differences um, as we talk about global perspectives? Are there differences across the JPEG region or even on the global scale? And which are those? Now it's your turn to be on mute, Nick. There we go. That's file number two. I'm just, just helping you out, Andy. I can feel better. There are definitely differences that we see. Um, and, you know, all the things that you mentioned there around, you know, um, leakage and asset management and everything, that's, that, that's at different rates in different areas that we see as a vendor going into, into these markets. Um, what we do see fairly consistently, though, across JPAC or APAC and, and the wider world is we're increasingly seeing digital customer engagement solutions as being considered quite important and, and popular with, with utilities in, in, their, in their digital transformations. So what we've noticed is what we've noticed is that customers or water consumers, I guess, have evolved to that next step, placing greater demand on on their on their water companies. Um, and I, I guess they're learning directly from you know from their from their digital rideshare service, their movie services, etc. And they're expecting a similar level of service. Um, so so I guess what we see is this need to deliver a a, a comprehensive mix of in intelligent but contextual service capabilities has been quite widespread globally. Um, but that said, you know, I did mention that there are different different focuses in different regions, you know, um, aging in infrastructure in the more developed economies. I think we talked about that a bit in, in the previous forum, in the previous session. The aging infrastructure is, is, is big in markets for us, such as, such as Europe, uh, US, and even places like uh, Japan and Korea. Um, and then there's other things like the, there's the regulatory structure is a big is a big um, uh, determinant determinant for um, the difference between the different regions and we see things like in the um, in in UK as an example in UK C and I which is which is competitive water so we see an uptick for um, better uh, B two B digital marketing solutions in market like markets like that but also in markets like Australia we see um, an uptick in um, in marketing solutions or outreach outreach digital outreach solutions. Um, uh, in terms of reaching out to customers um, and consumers around things like water con conservation programs. So yes, we do see differences, but then there's probably more similarities than, than differences I would, have to, I would have to admit. Thank you. And I think just picking up on a topic from the other panel, right? If you mentioned customer engagement, I mm. think the very exciting part here is that it can be a two-way street, right? Uh, that you use the human as a sensor, so to speak, which brings that human closer to the water services as well. You can combine it with, let's say you advise me on a leak, you get a you get a 50% cut on your next uh, water tariff bill or whatever. You can really create that interaction, that bonding that I think we're missing, at least in this part of the world, uh, very often because we think take things for granted and therefore there is no interest, there's no willingness to pay and whatnot. So I think that's that's very exciting. Nick, you're also unique in the sense that uh, on this panel, you're the one having a view on other infrastructures as well. So I want to, I always like to actually learn more from other spaces than talk about the same things all over again from our own um, sort of space, the water space. So if you could quickly share what the differences are with, I understand you cover the energy space as well, but maybe there are other infrastructure systems where you're involved. Are there any differences in terms of what the solutions are that are in demand and also maybe the kind of barriers that you face in the different uh, uti utility areas? What is different in the water space compared, for example? Just give us, give us some insight on that front as well. Yes. So, so I, I deal mainly, I deal in electricity, gas and water uh, industries mainly, and they are very similar, of course, and, and you know, all, all electricity, you know, all those utilities, they, they've got this natural level of conservatism, it, which flows through all utilities. Um, and, you know, what? that's not surprising, you know, utilities are, 
typically regulated industries that have a, have a, a very high public sector, uh, have a very high public interest involved, and so they, they need to be conservative. So things like um, you know cloud adoption, which is a great example. Um, traditionally, we've seen utilities being laggards in 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 that area. It's not necessarily bad. I mean, it's good to go second sometimes to learn, to learn the mistakes of others, right? Um, so, but we do see that. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, the natural conservatism is probably one thing. But other things too that we see, um, you know, often when I when we give a conference or something, there's focus that we have both water and, and electricity in the market in, in 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 the audience for us. What we do see is the water guys come along to to see what's happening in electricity because often, um, especially in some of the markets in in ANZ at least, um, uh, what I've been told, some some of the water guys like to see the learnings from electricity, and and one of them is around smart meter rollout. Um, I know Andy just spoke about that just, just before. And, and one of the key learnings that we've picked up from our customers about smart meter rollout is the need, and once again, the word of customer engagement, the term customer engagement, the need to engage your customer about well, what's the actual purpose of the smart meter. Um, very often business cases are, are built out on a whole number of things. And invariably that business case is directly linked to the customer extracting value from that, from that asset in the field, just as much as it is for the utility. So there's numerous examples about smart meter rollouts not going as well as it could because the customer hasn't been engaged properly. And you know you could point to um, PG&E, a, a, a very large utility company in California that had huge um, issues with their smart meter rollout. And in fact, it, it spawned an anti-smart meter movement, if you, if you hadn't heard, um, and that they had huge PR issues. Um, the, the smart meter rollout in Victoria, the state where I live in, um, this was this was now way back, almost 15 years ago. Um, that was rolled out relatively successful at a technical level. However, it failed to realise its full business case because customers did not um, they, they they did not sort of um, move on the value that it can bring from different from um, you know to understanding consumption patterns and all that sort of stuff. So there is a big need to um, engage the the customer through customer engagement, and I think that's probably. Um, one of the, you know, the water companies often coming, being a bit more of a laggard, they can see those changes coming through and, and hopefully learn from it. Okay, thank you. Now, the other topic that I would like to address, since I'm sure we have some uh, smaller and larger tech companies here um, that are related to this uh, smart water space, I want to touch on the adoption cycles as well and what's happening on that front in different utilities. So um, both asking you, Andy and Rebecca, and maybe let's start with Rebecca. Um, how does a usual adoption cycle look like? Like if, a, if, a, if an interesting technology approaches you on the digital front uh, and you in your role decide, oh, this has some legs, we should look at this in more detail. How does the usual path look like? What is the timeline? And what are the sort of the gating items that these tech companies have to be aware of? Uh, and yeah, let's let's stop there for now. Okay, um, I think it's it's actually really difficult to name a timeline. I think that the time from an approach or a business decision to a deployment can vary greatly, and you know that's influenced by the scale of that. You know, is it an experiment versus are we looking to make a a purchase for something that's enterprise level capability? Um, how difficult is it to integrate? Is it largely standalone? Does it require complex integration to our core systems? So I think, you know, it's a tough one to answer with any level of um, specific. Uh, Let's say most, 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 uh, most uh, what would be the quickest and what would be sort of the, the, the longest it would take? I think, you know, for, if we're replacing core systems, you know, those are potentially projects that are years in the making. Um, if we want to experiment with some new sensor technology and, you know, we're happy to treat it as an MVP and it doesn't require much in the, in the way of integration, you know, that can be weeks in the making. Um, I think the biggest influence is, you know, the extent to which we see technology vendors starting to standardise with things like um, open APIs and comms networks and, you know, a move away from a lot of proprietary technology, the easier it's going to make us to, uh, for, for us to trial and test and experiment with things. And I think also just picking up on a point that Nick made, you know, it's fair to say that historically, I think 
um, water utilities have been risk adverse and fairly conservative. So the appetite to experiment perhaps hasn't been there. I, I think we're seeing the tide change on that a lot more now um, and we are much more open to inviting in uh, vendors and partners to bring their ideas to the table and to really much more deliberately experiment with the intent of learning rather than experiment on um, something that is in fact a, a, a known and proven technology in which case it's very unlike an experiment. So I think, you know, as we start to see um, that uh, appetite continue to grow, we will naturally move to make it easier to turn these things around as quickly as possible and get to a point where you can make a decision on whether you're going to shut it down or proceed. Yeah, I think you you refer to an important point at the beginning and that for any, any tech provider, right, um, we sometimes in love with the value proposition we bring to the table that can be dramatic, gigantic, but the more gigantic it is, the more impact it has on your core business. Therefore, the longer it will likely take to actually adopt it, right? So one has to be aware of that dilemma. And I think it's, it's an interesting one. Andy, any, any comments from your end in terms of adoption cycles or maybe even what you do to fast track certain adoption of, of digital solutions? Yeah, I, I agree with well, I agree with all the points Rebecca said, you know, I think, you know, if we're looking at a small scale solution like we've done recently around sort of condition based monitoring technology, sensor technologies from first pitch to undertaking a trial, we're probably there within six to eight weeks. And if that trial is successful, we could probably roll that out within 12 months. If we're looking at much larger scale um, implementations or, or systems and solutions, it might be a whole lamp. I think because it depends on a number of factors. You talked about scale. I think one of the interesting things for us is when we're looking at these, these sorts of areas, um, we have to make sure we actually comply with EU procurement law. So, you know, there's a threshold before you have to go out for tender. That really does slow things up within your own organisation, making sure that you comply with that. Integration with those existing systems is always going to be an issue in an organisation of our size, you know. The impact that those things can have, you know, we, we operate cr critical national infrastructure. We, we cannot just take that risk, which is probably why we are a little bit risk averse. Affordability is there. But I think we're really lucky. So we've got two particular areas. So we, we have our shop window, which is our innovation incubator, which is open for all. Um, and it's actually a physical part of our network where we fast track innovations actively collaborate with supply chain and that's really coming back to the value proposition because what we want to do in there is work with those suppliers to actually build that value proposition and um, I think we do need to become less risk averse you know if you think it's going to be good generally it probably is you know so just go with it and, and that's where the shop window helps us it's a uh, so literally our playground where we can really drive innovation. And then the other one we've got is our water innovation network, which is a network we've set up um, where we set challenges. So we actually go out there with a particular challenge and invite small, medium enterprises to actually come with their solutions. And then we've got a mechanism within the business to evaluate those on a monthly basis. Okay. And you already mentioned AMP. Uh, I guess for our international audience, you may want to explain quickly what it is. Uh, but no, um, uh, following, following, following that, actually, the broader question that I have for you is, um, with Ofwat, you have a very distinct regulator uh, that is unique on a, on a global scale. So the question that I have there is, um, and it's partly related to the experiences that I had, uh, so I'm curious about your view, to which extent has this sort of boosted the adoption of certain digital solutions and to which extent has it potentially hindered uh, some more advanced solution? What's your view on that one? So just to explain, an AMP is an asset management period. Um, so this is where all our price controls are set, you know, our, our, our challenges, you know, our targets, the outcomes that we need to achieve um, by our regulator. So it's a five year period. And we, um, last year we started AMP 7. Um, and it's so important within the water industry in the UK because it ties in with things like your um, water resources management plan. So it's about how we how we build our business cases going forward. So I think when, when it comes to off what as a unique regulator, um, 
They've really put innovation in the round and at the forefront of the regulatory agenda. And I think some of that is because, you know, we get very challenging determinations in the UK around efficiency. We have multiple performance commitments and they really tend to focus the mind, you know. So we have performance commitments around leakage, interruptions to supply, um, sustainability, um, carbon, all those sorts of things are there, you know. Um, I think it, it does actually encourage us to use smart solutions to meet those challenges because the way we're doing it now, we, we, we really have to drive efficiency. And I think then this AMP, for the first time, we um, off what have introduced their innovation fund. Um, so that's a 200 million fund, which is accessible to all of the UK water companies. But what they've actually done is set a number of criteria. So we actually literally have to put our bids in um, for that money, which is customers' money. But what that does is, and they will not accept a single bid from a company, so it actively um, encourages us to collaborate across the sector. And that funding um, is really driven for transformational change within the water industry. We've just had um, the first round of the smaller element of that, and we're now moving into the, we've just had a bid accepted in terms of the larger fund for this year. So I, I think that's really good. Um, what I would say is I think traditionally the, the five year amp cycles when it comes to smart technology um, have caused us some problems because I think a lot of the smart solutions that we're looking at probably have a longer payback than that five year period. So the industry's really driven on that five year period. I think Offwatt's just announced the fact that they will start to look at longer term um, horizons, maybe 30 years and divided up into that. So that should help us with a lot of our smart solution investment going forward. And I look forward to that. Excellent. So I want to hold my promise and uh, address some of the questions that have been raised by the audience. I actually see it here in the chat, Rob, I can uh, jump in directly. Um, so one question is in terms of collaboration, uh, what can utilities learn from others smart water experience without reinventing the wheel? Maybe any kind of collaboration schemes that your utilities have been implemented already? Um, Rebecca, you wanna take a shot at this one? I can do. I, I would say we are um, in the very early days of our smart meter experience and we have been um, very deliberate in reaching out to other water utilities that are further ahead in that journey than we are um, in the hope that uh, we can learn from their experiences and um, that we don't you know, potentially make the same mistakes um, or, or have the same bad experiences that they've had. I think um, there is absolute value in doing that and there are a number of forums like the Swan Forum through which you can do that. I think the challenge for us is actually the, the things that um, are unique about New Zealand in our setting will be the things that we can't learn from anyone else on. And as an example, our meter boxes are in the ground. Um, they are typically in very wet conditions and our experience with some of the smart meter technologies so far is that they don't perform particularly well in those conditions. And it's very difficult in some circumstances to get comm signal out of those boxes. So I think there's a real um, a balance there with you know utilizing the opportunities to learn from others um, and being really active in, in doing that and very deliberate in doing that, but also acknowledging that you know that, that you will in fact go into these um, projects with a set of hypotheses that you know you will either prove or disprove along the way and all of that learning is equally as valuable to delivering an outcome and in some respects you know the, the notion of failure reframed as a notion of learning is probably the mindset shift that we need to make there. Thanks Rebecca. Andy any any ideas from your end how to foster collaboration among utilities yeah, or anything you do in particular? <clears throat> Yeah, so obviously we play an active role in, in things like SWAN. You know, we've been a SWAN member for 10 years now. I think the, the other thing for us, I, I have some of those forums. We, we've set up an active collaborative forum um, with Vitens and Global Omnium. Um, and coming back to Rebecca's point, I think we lead in certain elements, you know, in terms of leakage management, stuff like that. Uh, Global Omnium in terms of digital twin, um, Vitens in terms of treatment um, of water. So... We actively participate and we, we have weekly, monthly meetings with these guys now. And I think, you know, the, the recent move to, 
digital forums, we used to do that face to face, um, has actually meant we, we're probably actively collaborating more in that space. I think the other thing is um, collaborating with academia is very important. But the, the main thing in the smart water space for me is actively collaborate with the supply chain. You know, someone might have a really good idea, struggling to bring it to market. I, I think, you know, we have a really good track record of really enhancing the value of key suppliers who have worked with us over a number of years and building those relationships. Trust is really important. Yeah, no, I like I like to hear that because, yeah, sometimes you have a great idea. You just don't know how the customer can actually yeah. embrace it, given their, their own processes and so on. Thank you. So moving to question number uh, two that we received, Nick, I will address that to you. And that is, broadly speaking, it has a few different dimensions in the question, but broadly speaking, it is about willingness to pay. How can we convince customers, we talked about customer engagement earlier, how can we convince customers to be open that the utility deploys new technologies? And while the, the question implies that it may cost more, uh, I hope it wouldn't cost more. It would lower the bill. But if it does, uh, how can we how can we create that buy-in with customers? Well, I, I it has to be a win-win, right? It, you know, I, customers are very rarely going to say, I, "I think it's a great little new little technology toy. I'll, I'll pay for that." So there has to be a win-win. Um, and and things like you know, if we we you know, I think I was talking about smart water meters before. You know, the win for the customer is that they can self-manage their water use and cost. Um, they can receive water quality leak, uh, water quality updates, and 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 sort of get a better understanding of how they're consuming their water. So I think that's the thing that uh, needs to be sort of um, uh, put forward to the consumer um, to say, well, hang on, it's not just us winning here. It's not just us being the water utility. It's it's also the consumer. So there needs to be that relationship built up and uh, an understanding that this is for their benefit as well and then a realization of, of how those um, benefits can be realized by the customer and indeed that's that that customer benefit realization which is often baked into many uh, business cases um, that's the part that's often the easiest it's, that's often missed so that's um, so there's, there's an emphasis to I think just to focus on the on the win-win side of, of all of it yeah, and I think I pick up one statement that you made or one one expression, and that is that relationship build up, right? Mm. And it comes back again to this. I mean, we we as in we as a sector, I think we are, we are, we're masters in hiding. <laughs> sort of, we deliver a good service and a super yeah. impressive service, even if you compare it to other uh, utility services, right? Yeah. Delivering water uh, at the right temperature, good taste, twenty four seven. Unfortunately, not everywhere on this planet, uh, but still, um, and then even taking care of a waste stream, <laughs> which other, mm -hmm. which other mm -hmm. utility function uh, needs to do that, right? And, and that taking care of a waste stream, providing public health primarily, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and draining our utilities when there are storms and so on, uh, our municipalities when there are storms. Something that makes, creates that awareness with our customers is super important, right? And I think I come back to this the human as a sensor. I think that's a that's a great gift that we should use as a as a sector to build that relationship, to mm. make them excited about the things that happen around water, uh, because emotionally everybody is already connected. We just need to harvest it in a smart way, right? Yeah, and and I, I actually see that you know we're talking about digital technologies and how we can benef benefit from it uh, within the water industry. But digital technology is just the, the first part of it. The, the main part of it is the digital transformation. It's one thing to, to roll out all the technology solutions out there, but transformation implies that your business does transform and goes to, you know, let's say, hopefully the next, the next state of evolution. So that, in, that can include everything from new business models, um, new ways from in, of thinking about how uh, water needs to be delivered. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, for... For the past, uh, and I think um, one of the earlier speakers mentioned, for the past 150 years, water companies have been excellent at providing safe and reliable water to, to their communities. And now what we're seeing, uh, partly through this, this tr digital transition that we're seeing globally and, 
and sort of um, rapidly accelerated by, by, by COVID and the lockdown effects uh, that were occurring last year and indeed this year. Um, we're seeing um, consumers are expecting a, a different way for services to be, to be delivered. Um, and I think not just digital technology, but the, but the promise of digital transformation has, uh, can, can help us a long way to actually meeting some of those needs from, from consumers. Yeah. And coming back to a comment that George made, right? That's why it needs to be a CEO topic. Um, I mean, it needs to be yeah, a topic sure. for the CTOs and the, the dedicated smart water people. But uh, in terms of transformation, it's a CEO topic. Okay, we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, I thank my panelists. I would encourage the audience to reach out to them. I, my goal here was to make you understand that they all have a very unique uh, background that is worth uh, to tap into, to understand how things are done at their organizations, the challenges that they face around digital. Um, it was a pleasure to have you and discuss with you these topics. Obviously, we should go around the corner and have a beer or something or a coffee because it's early here. But we will do that some other time, I guess. So. Uh, thanks again to all of you, uh, and I'm not sure if there is any final comment after this. If not, uh, then I say goodbye from this swan session. If there is somebody coming in, then please add another note to it. But thanks again to Rebecca, Andy, and Nick. I hope to see you soon in person. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.